Good afternoon. My name is Lourdes German. I'm the Director of International and Institute-Wide Initiatives at the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy. And I want to thank you for taking the afternoon to join us for an event that we're very excited about with our a wonderful partner of ours, the team from the OECD in Paris, to um, celebrate and present the launch of their report, The Governance of Land Use, which is sort of the first time the report is being made public. So we expect some great conversation and great questions from all of you. So those of you who know the Lincoln Institute um, know our tagline, Finding Answers in Land. So it should be really, really obvious why we're so excited about this report and really see the content um, as integral to our work and at the center of both our municipal fiscal health campaign and efforts um, happening across our other departments in urban planning and what our colleagues think about land use and zoning. <clears throat> now there's no better person to introduce you to a little bit about our mission and tell you further why we're so excited to have the team from the OECD Paris here. Um, so I'd like to introduce our CEO, George Mac McCarthy, up to the stage to um, kick off our program by telling you a little bit about um, why we're here and what we hope to achieve today. And just as a matter of logistics, the way that our program will flow today is following Max's introduction. We're going to have a presentation of the report by um, the OECD team from Paris. After that, we're going to have a moderated discussion, a Q&A that we hope you'll participate in, including other experts from the Boston Fed and from our own network. And so we hope that you'll hold all those burning, insightful questions for that portion so we can have a real robust conversation and dialogue. And then that you'll join us for a cocktail reception over in sort of the lovely area adjoining the roof garden. So thank you, and Mac, take it away. Thanks, Lourdes. And thank you all for coming out. It's a little bit of a dreary day out, and hopefully we'll be able to make it less dreary in the room here. Um, so the Lincoln Institute, we've uh, been around for just over 70 years now, and you know we've been doing a lot of work in terms of original research and um, education and training um, around land policy issues. Our origins go back to um, a chance encounter between our founder, John C. Lincoln, and Henry George uh, back in the day when Henry George, if you don't know, a 19th century um, political theorist, political economist, who um, was trying to reconcile two things, the um, uh, unbelievable opulence of the Industrial Revolution and the persistence of poverty at the same time. And so he did his own analysis to figure out why it was that in the face of this opulence we had this persistent poverty. And he concluded that it was a distribution problem, that it was actually uh, that we were giving too much of the benefits of economic growth to idle landowners and not enough to the more active and engaged sectors of the economy, labor, and uh, entrepreneurs. And so he proposed that he, we could eradicate poverty and fund the public sector if we taxed away the value of land, which is, of course, land policy answering some of the big um, pressing challenges globally. Well, you know, that was, Henry George was writing that about 100 years ago, or more, 140 years ago now. And uh, we're still kind of um, on that same mission, trying to find a way to use land policy to address pressing issues uh, around the globe. But the, maybe the issues have changed a little bit, although poverty, still persistent, still around in the face of opulence. Then we've got other, you know, external issues we, need, we also need to address, like climate change, or um, the uh, the sprawling unplanned settlements around cities, uh, especially uh, cities in the global south. And so we think that uh, if we can find a way to locate land policy as a driver of efforts to really address those issues, we'll go a lot further than just trying to get land policy right. Because in many uh, cases, we need to be able to tell people or show people the relevance of land policy to address these kinds of issues. And it's not always obvious the relationship between land, poverty, land policy and other kinds of bigger issues. And that's why we love a report like the report today, because they, they make some very, very clear connections between things that uh, might not appear to be land policy, but have real implications for how we, um, we inhabit land, particularly uh, in this country like income tax policy. Why do, we, why do we think the income tax policy is a land policy? Well, the mortgage interest deduction, probably the largest uh, um, set aside, if it were set aside, because it's never really collected, uh, of our national tax policy system has huge implications for how people choose to live. We choose in this country to be overhoused on larger lots than we need because we provide substantial tax benefits, particularly to those who are really wealthy. And, you know, it's not obvious why that would be a land policy, except that it has everything to do with how we live. 
And once we decide how we're going to live, it doesn't change very easily. And this is one of those issues that will be addressed in this, uh, in this uh, work and also in a lot of the other work that, that Lincoln is doing. So, uh, that, so that's kind of who we are. But, um, and how we work has also changed a little, little bit because we're now trying to really move our footprint from kind of the sleepy, cozy uh, areas of uh, the Gold Coast of Cambridge to the globe. And part of getting uh, a more global presence is really allying ourselves with key institutions, two of whom are here with us today, or we're here with them because the, the host, the Federal Reserve of Boston, is one of those organizations that we'd love to partner with to pursue um, aligned uh, missions. And uh, we've been uh, enjoying the work uh, or working together with the Boston Fed for a long time, and particularly Bob Triest and now um, Darcy uh, Sass. So it's really, really uh, great to be here, especially because you have um, a much better view from here than we have from our offices on the Gold Coast of uh, Brattle Street. And then, of course, the OECD. Uh, Lourdes and I had the opportunity to travel to Paris in, uh, in, uh, September, no, in uh, February, and we thought, well, we'll just kind of explore the few things we have going on with the OECD. Turned out we had two full days of meetings. We talked about eight different projects that we actually have going on. And we realized, you know what? We're going to need to really find, locate somebody at the OECD just to keep the trains running and uh, to keep uh, the flow of paper going in the right direction. Uh, and I just we hadn't even realized it, of course. But one thing we had realized, and this has been confirmed many times, is that the OECD is a very complicated organization. And it, it t continues to um, be complicated because every time you turn around, they restructure. And we were just talking about that at lunch today. <laughs> but so from the OECD, we really uh, thank uh, our, um, our guest, uh, Rudiger Arendt, Tamara uh, Krachenko and, uh, and Abel Schumann. And uh, another uh, of our great partners there, Joachim, uh, is uh, not here. Joachim, and I always forget, his, he's got two, three names. Uh, <laughs> Olivier Martins, uh, um, he's not here today, but he's, he, would be, he is in spirit with, with his uh, <laughs> colleagues. So without further ado, I'll be back to um, bore you with some of my opinions later on. But uh, I'd like to just kind of introduce our guests, and uh, we'd love to hear some more about the report. So thank you. Well, I'm, I'm Rudiger Arendt from, from the OST in Paris. Um, and uh, I first, I actually wanted, really wanted to thank, I mean, uh, Lincoln. Um, we, we, we started this work on, on, on land use, the governance of land use that you're going to be presented today three years ago. And um, so it's not only the, the launch event today, where, where, which Lincoln has very kindly been organizing for us here, but all through the process, I mean, they've been helpful, I mean, in supporting our, our project. And for example, uh, Andrew Riskowski and Amy Kotta, they joined us as peer reviewers when we were doing a, a land use, governance of land use case study in Amsterdam. And that was extremely helpful for us. And so we're really very, very grateful for the support that we've been receiving from Lincoln all through, I mean, this project, basically. And um, also, while I'm, you know, thanking people, I'd also like to thank the, the Federal Reserve, I mean, and especially Robert Triest, I mean, who are receiving us today in these very prestigious rooms. And so I'm very pleased to be here. Thank you very much for your kind hospitality. Um, I have the impression that the OCD may not be an as known entity here than maybe as it deserves to be. So maybe I'll just give you some brief words about what the OCD is and what we're doing. The OECD basically is an international institution. I mean, you could think like World Bank, IMF, OECD, it's the same kind of thing. Uh, we have almost 3,000 people working for the OECD. We have almost everybody is in Paris. The main difference with some other international institutions is that we don't give money. We don't lend or we don't grant money. What we are basically doing is we are giving advice to governments. Our motto is better, better, better <clears throat> policies for better lives. And uh, so in that spirit, we are kind of like, I mean, we, in a way, we are, we are McKinsey for governments uh, in across the world, basically. <laughs> I mean, the OECD, in a way, it's a club. It has 35 member countries. So the member countries, I mean, the US is one of the member countries. I mean, they are kind of like paying a membership fee each year. And in, in, I mean, in exchange for that member fee, they're getting a certain amount of services. I already mentioned the, uh, you know, the advice function. So we have been producing reports like the ones that you see today. It's, uh, it's always applied research, I mean, policy relevant, um, so that we really kind of like help countries to do better policies as, as our motto. But then we are also, and that's maybe less well known, we are also being like a major um, networking institutions for our member countries. So the OECD is structured around 200 committees and working parties. 
But in these committees and working parties, the different um, delegates from the member states, from the different ministries of the of the member states, they're meeting regularly in in Paris. I mean, usually, I mean, for a working party or a committee, there's like two meetings per year. And during these meetings, we kind of like present our our research results. Uh, but there's also a lot of policy exchange between the uh, between the member countries of the OECD. Kind of like a lot of exchange of best practice. Also, people telling what they tried to do, what didn't work. And so that's a really important. Um, um, help basically for, for countries of the OECD to kind of like see what others have been doing and how the experience was and also kind of like, you know, you then have a network. And if you're facing a problem, you just kind of like, you know, call your, your friend from the country that may be relevant for you or you want to know something and just call them up and say, how, what did you do? Did it work? And that really is of great help for the different countries of the OECD. The OECD is not only restricted to its 35 member countries, it's also increasingly trying to reach out trying to help non-OCD member countries to have better policies, so we're engaging with other countries. I mean, um, in different parts of the world, increasingly also with um, the, the emerging economies, I mean, especially the large ones, because we're really trying, trying to, to um, help those countries, because by thinking, especially you know, when you're talking about issues like, I mean, global problems, like global warming, for example, then by helping these countries in a way, we're also helping our member countries. And so that's a bit... Um, um, just to give you a very brief overview over the OCD. So I've been diverging a bit from the topic of this <laughs> meeting today, but I thought it was, was important just to give you a brief impression what the OCD is about and what we're doing here. So within the OCD, I mean, as I was mentioning before, the largest part of the work is basically with the central governments of the member countries, but we're also having um, a special part of the OCD who's working with subnational actors, so among them with cities. And so we're having an urban program, which, which I'm heading, basically. And um, so we're working on a lot of different policy issues. And among them, we're trying to create um, data for internationally comparable cities. We've been writing a report on urbanization's consequences. We're working on productivity in cities. We've been doing a huge program on metropolitan governance and, its, and the consequences and how to improve metropolitan governance issues. Um, very important also, we're looking at multi-level governance. We've been looking at rural urban linkages because, I mean, it's not only cities that are important, but it's also important that the rural parts of the country benefit from the things that are happening in the city, so these linkages are very uh, relevant. Looking at urban green growth for the obvious reasons. Uh, also increasingly looking at inequality and inclusive growth, well-being issues, and also national urban policies. Um, given that we're having this really extensive work program, you may be wondering why we haven't put more effort and attention on working on land use policies earlier than we did. Because, I mean, as I was saying, we basically started this, uh, this project that fruits of which you'll be seeing today three years ago. And um, the answers are probably multiple, but part of the answer is that um, land use policies probably don't really fit into the traditional delineations of policy areas. It's not, when you're talking about land use, it's not clearly associated with one level of government. So here in the US, it's primarily a local issue, but in most other OECD countries, regional and national governments play an important role in land use too. Also, land use is not associated with a particular policy field. It affects outcomes in a lot of different policy areas and is affected by them. Um, so that creates a lot of complexity. And to be able to, to master that, we've been collaborating with colleagues, for example, from the Environment Directorate in the OECD and the Center for Tax Policy. And lastly, our team for urban and rural policy cooperated closely on this work. And this reflects the fact that the most important conflicts of our land typically occur not in the city or city centers or in the really rural areas, but basically at the peri-urban area where um, basically the use for urban and rural land are basically competing and where also kind of like, I mean, a lot of um, distributional consequences are taking place by the fact that land is basically transferred from the rural use where it rel usually has relatively low value to an urban use where the prices usually massively increase once this is done. Having said all these things, I mean, the fact that land use does not fit into the established policy categories, it does not mean it's not important. Right to the contrary. It's central to many policy issues of work at the OECD. One of them is economy, economic performance and productivity. Um, land and buildings, and you'll see more details about that, are by far the most important form of capital. It is important for environmental sustainability, and it is crucial for well-being and the quality of life of everybody. So 
In our project, we have analyzed land use and land use policies across all OECD countries. As you will see, um, the US is in many ways unique in how land use policies work. For example, there are few other countries where the local level has such a prominent role in setting land use policies. But we see the same challenges appearing in most OECD member countries, and we believe that we have identified policy recommendations that are important in all OECD countries and also in most of the non OECD countries. I mean, to, to just, I mean, coming back to the issue also of outreach to other countries beyond the OECD countries. We also believe there's a great deal that our member governments can learn from each other. We have seen many innovative solutions that can be valuable in other contexts. Today, we launched two reports that are the culmination of almost three years of work on the topic, as I mentioned earlier. But we do not plan to stop our work on the topic. We plan to work on the following issues going forward. That's land value capture, housing and housing prices, and we're also interested in doing further land use case studies. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to use the next uh, 20 to, to uh, 25 minutes to, to give you a brief overview of uh, the, the, our two reports before handing over the, uh, the floor to, uh, to my colleague Tamara. Um, before I actually go into the, the content of uh, the two reports that I'm going to, uh, to present, I would like to give you a very, very brief overview of, uh, of what those two reports are actually are. So first we have uh, this report that you uh, probably all have in front of you, that is uh, land use planning in the uh, land use planning systems in the OECD, uh, country fact sheets, and in this report we uh, present uh, as the title says, the land use planning systems in 32 OECD countries. Uh, for example, we uh, provide an overview of the different uh, land use and spatial plans in, in uh, each member country. We show their relation to each other in a, in a, in a uh, diagram. Um, in the case of the US, that is uh, probably not too exciting because the US has a very uh, basic uh, land use planning system com compared to many other OECD countries, but as you will see in here, um, there are some countries where the, uh, the, the planning system and the, the uh, different uh, land use plans that exist have a very high degree of complexity. Um, so this report is really intended as a resource. So uh, we don't expect anybody to read it from fr front to end, but we hope that this is something that uh, can be useful as a, as a resource to, to look up if you're interested in a particular uh, planning system in, in a certain country or if you simply want to compare uh, different approaches across different countries and maybe also get a bit of inspiration how, how things are done in other parts of the world. Then we have the, the second report that we are launching today and that is uh, the governance of land use in OECD countries and in this report we really try to, um, to do some analytical work. We try to, to analyze the, the uh, main issues that, uh, that uh, are related to public policy and, and land use uh, governance and we also, of course, try to give uh, policy recommendations because, as Rudiger said, this is our, our main mission. And so this is the, this is the report where really our, our key messages are presented and our key findings are presented. And um, I'm going to, to use uh, the, uh, uh, my time to, to give you some of those uh, key highlights uh, of, of the report. If I, um, I actually start with the, the policy recommendations, I would like to present a few numbers and uh, to present a few statistics to, to provide a bit of, of background and maybe also to provide a, a bit of an international perspective on, on, the, on the issues of land use. And I always like to, to start out with this slide. What we see here is the value of the total capital stock um, disaggregated by several categories. And we see here that uh, there are two categories that absolutely dominate. So we have, on the, uh, we have on, the, on the one hand, we have land, and uh, on the other hand, we have uh, uh, property and, and, and the infrastructure that is uh, constructed on the land. And together, those, uh, those two categories actually make up 86% of the, the value of the total capital stock. So if we compare this to, to other categories that we normally think are quite important. For example, intellectual property, all the, all the patents and the, the, the knowledge. I mean, we see this, that those categories are completely dwarfed by, 
by by land and uh, by 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 the buildings constructed on land. So this is, I think, this is a, a, a quite a striking graph, and that is is uh, always a good good motivation to to explain people why are we are interested in the in the topic of land use, especially when we talk to people uh, to whom uh, land use is is uh, not their their primary field of work. So how does land use? actually look like across uh, the OECD. And here I focus especially on, on urban areas and I am presenting a very basic metric. So I'm just showing how much land is actually used on a per capita basis. So I simply take the, the total area of, of developed land in urban areas and I divide it by the, by the, uh, by the number of, of people living in those urban areas. And uh, here we see the um, the, the area of, of developed land per capita actually in, in, in square meters, uh, to, to convert this into square feet, it's, it's uh, just roughly multiplied by 10. So what we see here is that the US is on the, on the, on the very left-hand side of the graph. So in no other OECD country, there's as much developed land on a per capita basis as, as the, the, in the US. So for example, when we when we compare this to uh, to the to to the United uh, Kingdom, to Great Britain, we see that the average resident in in the commuting zone <coughs> of an urban area in the United States uses approximately uh, 1,900 square meters of developed land, whereas the the corresponding value in the in in Great Britain is roughly 400 square meters of developed land. And of course, the U.S. is uh, of, of all OECD countries. The, the U.S. Is, is one of the, the richest countries, so it might seem seem plausible to think that this difference is primarily explained by by different income levels in in the different OECD countries. But it actually turns out that it's not. So, so we when we use statistical techniques to control for different in income levels, we actually see that the the differences between the different OECD member countries are uh, basically do not uh, do not disappear at all. So it really seems that there's more to it, and, and most likely it is that this is, is related to, to political issues and, and perhaps also to, to cultural issues. When we see that uh, how, how the, uh, the amount of developed land uh, has actually changed, over time we, see, um, we, we can see two, two things. First of all, we see that uh, since 2000, uh, developed land in, in all OECD countries has been growing, has, has been growing most strongly in in Ireland, which was not coincidentally one of the, the countries that experienced the, the uh, strongest housing bubble in the in the early 2000s, but it has been growing in in uh, all OECD member countries, and again it has been growing particularly strongly in the in the commuting zones of urban areas. So, at least uh, what we can see from from this basic statistic is that there has been a. a, a continuing trend towards uh, sprawling, sprawling development. But at the same time, this picture might give a slightly misleading perspective because, as I said before, what matters is not, not only the, the total area of developed land, but it actually matters uh, to what degree land is used on a per capita basis. And we also saw that in, in most, uh, most urban areas in, uh, across the OECD, Population has been growing uh, since 2000, and what we have, act what we can actually uh, see is that in in many countries, population growth has been faster than the growth in developed land. So, according to that metric, the the, the picture looks much more nuanced, and we actually see that in quite a few uh, quite a few uh, OECD countries, uh, land use in urban areas has has uh, has become more sparing in the sense that the, the the, areas, the area of developed land per capita has actually been declining. And we see, again, that the, the US is, is uh, at the very end of this chart, but this time it is at the, at the, exactly at the other end of the chart. We have seen that, uh, we, we see that in, uh, the, the, OECD, uh, the, the US has experienced very strong population growth in, uh, in urban areas since 2000, but that population growth has not been matched by a corresponding uh, uh, growth in in the area of developed land. This is maybe the, the most complex chart, but I also promise it's the, the, the last uh, chart relating to, to land use statistics. But I think it's, it's complicated, but it's worth presenting nevertheless. So what we see here is how the uh, average per capita land use uh, 
is distributed across the different metropolitan areas in the United States. And again, the, it's, uh, we, we d divide uh, the, the picture between the, the urban cores and the uh, commuting zones. So basically, on the, on the uh, horizontal axis, we see the uh, average amount of developed land per capita. And on the horizontal axis, we see how many metropolitan or urban areas uh, have this average uh, per cap per ca uh, use of, of developed land per capita. And from, from those two charts, we can see actually two, two different issues. And the first issue is, is probably not surprising. And we see that, that uh, development and land use in, uh, in, the, in the urban cores, in the, in the city centers, is on a per capita basis is much more compact. I mean, that is probably not a, not a surprise to, to uh, anybody. <laughs> But what we can also see is that uh, in, in the urban cores, the per capita uh, use of developed land is roughly similar. So there's, there's very little variation between the different metropolitan areas. Whereas when we look at the commuting zones at the, at the suburban areas, we actually see that there's a lot of variation between the, the different, uh, between the different urban areas, between the different metropolitan areas. So we have some, some urban areas where uh, the, the uh, area of developed land per capita is well below 1,000 square meters, but then we have others where it's uh, above 3,000, 4,000 uh, square meters. And this is actually when we, when we uh, I, I, I even cut off a few few um, areas because otherwise the, the, the graph would ha wouldn't have fitted. So from this we can, uh, we can really see that uh, variation in land use is by far the biggest in the, in the suburban areas, in the commuting zones. And, I think this is actually an indication that commuting zones are where public policy really matters. So commuting zones is where, where planning policies matter. Commuting zones is where, where uh, transit policies matter. So, so this is where uh, it really has an effect whether you have an, an, an efficient and, and uh, convenient public transit system or not. So, so I think this is, this is an important message that we can, can, can learn from, from this graph. So let me let me now move on to to a slightly different topic, uh, because when we talk about uh, about land use, uh, we, we of course we do not talk about land use for for the sake of of, of land use, but we we talk about land use because land is important to people, and and we want we we need to do different things with uh, uh, with land, and of course one of the most elementary things that we do with land is that we use land to to live on it, and. Um, and in, in this context, uh, a very important issue is, of course, uh, house prices and housing costs. And um, here I have plotted uh, house price developments uh, starting in, in 1995 uh, until the, the end of last year, actually. And what we can see is that across almost all OECD countries, uh, inflation-adjusted housing costs have risen very, very strongly. So we see, actually, that in the, in the United States, inflation-adjusted housing costs are roughly 50% <laughs> higher than they were in uh, 1995. And this is even after the, the big correction uh, following the, the, the bursting of the, of the housing bubble in, in 2007. And in this picture, the US is by far not the, the most extreme case. Actually, a majority of, uh, of OECD countries have experienced much uh, stronger rises in housing price. And we see in a, in a country like Sweden, uh, house prices are, are now more than three times as high as they were in, in 1995, inflation adjusted. So this is the real house prices. Uh, and um, this, of course, uh, uh, this creates uh, important issues because that, that creates important uh, affordability problems for, for, for first-time house, buy house buyers, for, for young families. And um, this context, it's obvious that uh, Land use policies play an important role. Of course, they, they are not the, the only drivers, but uh, we think that um, that land use policies are, are cer play certainly uh, part of a role in this uh, in this development. So uh, it's something that that is quite important because on on the one hand, of course, land use land use regulations and and, and planning policies they have the aim of uh, preventing preventing sprawl and and too expansive. Uh, uh, development because we, are, we all know that this creates uh, 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 negative externalities. But at the same time, uh, it's also it's important that um, that there is uh, sufficient space available and sufficient land available to uh, to construct housing for for growing populations. If 
populations rise uh, consistently, uh, population rises consistently faster than the supply of of housing, we we should not be uh, surprised if, uh, if housing costs go up in the in the in the medium and long term. So, what are the the policy recommendations that uh, that can follow from this uh, from this general overview? So, one issue is that there's uh, very little densification going on at the moment, and we think this is a this is a problem. So, there's no. No good, uh, no good data on on densification uh, that is that is systematic and that is as uh, cross cutting across several countries, but from the existing data we actually see that there's very very little uh, densification. So we actually th what the data shows us is that in in Europe less than 0.01 percent of the built up land has uh, has increased in morphological density since 2000. I mean this is a tiny, tiny fraction. When we look actually at data for the US, it looks like uh, that there's a bit more densification going on, but it's still very, very, very small. So in the US, uh, we have the, the data indicates that, that less than 1% of the land has been, has, uh, in, of the developed land has increased in, in morphological density. So has, 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 uh, the, the building stock has increased in density. And of course, th this is a problem because if we want to, to, to prevent expansive sprawling development, we have to build somewhere. And if we don't, if we don't densify, that means we, we, we cannot, cannot build anywhere. And then we should not be surprised that we see the, the picture of, uh, of, of uh, rising housing costs that we, we saw, saw before. Just to, to go a bit more into the detail why, why the lack of densification is a problem, um, Many cities today have, have densities that are similar to, to what they were at the time when they were first developed. And that basically has the consequence that neighborhoods that were initially built on the outskirts and back then had, had fairly, fairly low densities, they, are, they, they, they still have the same densities. But in the meantime, the cities have been growing and the, the neighborhoods that were 50 years ago in the, in the periphery of, of a city, they, they are now part of the, the urban core and they um, and they, they are really part of the of, of, of the, the city center, but they do not have the, the corresponding densities. They still have the densities that they had 50 years ago, and that were appropriate when they were built 50 years ago, but that are not uh, appropriate to to, uh, to the new uh, new city size. Um, of course, when we when we talk about about increasing densities, it's always important to say that it's not only to necessary to densify, but especially when we talk about densification, it's of course important to talk about the, the quality of the, the, the built environment, because when we talk about the uh, denser built environment, it's, it's really important to have, have, have high quality uh, built environment in order to, to, uh, to ensure uh, a good living environment and to ensure high well-being of the residents, because that becomes much more problematic when we talk about uh, more dense developments. What can public policy do to uh, to ensure that we 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 can build uh, denser cities, but that uh, that have a high quality built environment? We think that it's important to to think a bit about systematically about uh, the different fields of public policy, inf uh, how the different fields of public policy influence uh, land use. What we see on the left hand side of the of this diagram is the, the public policies that are traditionally aimed at steering, uh, steering land use. And there we have, uh, we have the different uh, fields of planning. We have uh, spatial planning, transport planning, land use planning, urban planning. And we have the different uh, uh, environmental regulations, building code regulations. And all those policies are, are policies that are typically used uh, by, by policymakers to, to target how land is used. And they all have in common that they uh, that they determine how land is permitted to be used. But then we have a second field of public policies, and that second field of public policies influences how businesses and individuals want to use land. So those public policies uh, on the, on the right-hand side of this chart, they actually influence uh, the incentives for land use that, are, uh, that public policy uh, provide. And among them are tax policies, uh, transport taxes and, and subsidies, fiscal, uh, the, the setup of fiscal systems and inter intergovernmental transfers, and things like agricultural policies and, and energy policies. 
And all those policy fields provide important incentives for land use, but they all have in common that land use is typically typically not the, 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 the focus of attention for policymakers who, who operate in these fields. In the best case, land use is, a, is, a, is an outcome that is considered at the, at the site, but what we have unfortunately realized is that uh, a lot of, uh, of the policymakers operating in the, in the policy fields on, on the right-hand side pay very little to, um, attention to land use. And that creates, a, that creates a, a problematic outcomes because that means that we have all the the public policies uh, uh, that are aimed at land use, they, they have certain objectives and they try to, to push uh, development in a certain direction. But then we have a lot of, of other public policies that often have uh, provide quite contradicting incentives to, uh, to, to businesses and individuals. So let me just uh, tell you a bit, uh, to give you a few, few more examples before I hand over to my colleague uh, Tamara. What, what I actually mean with those the, those contradicting incentives. So, for example, we have the the the, the objective of of uh, building uh, of 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 preventing urban um, sprawl and building uh, compact uh, um, environments. But then we have, as as, as Mac mentioned, uh, a thing like the the home mortgage interest tax deductibility that encourages uh, uh, home ownership and that in particular encourages uh, uh, that provides incentives to to uh, to own large, expensive homes, because then that, that means uh, the, the, the mortgage deductibility is, uh, the, the, the tax deductibility is higher. And this is, of course, this is an instrument that primarily aims at encouraging home ownership. But it has the, the unintended consequence that it has, has quite strong, uh, provides quite strong in incentives for a particular type of land use, and it provides incentives for, for a sprawling, expansive land use. At the same time, we, we have the, the case that in many OECD countries, uh, uh, the, the, the car owners do not, do not face the, the true costs of driving. So, so driving creates externalities in, in, uh, in the sense of it creates uh, congestion, it, it creates uh, environmental issues uh, such, as, such as air pollution and so on. But typically drivers um, do not face those, those externalities, which means driving is, is, uh, is, is cheaper than it, than it should be from a societal perspective. And while this, of course, creates environmental problems and so on, it also has important consequences for land use because it basically encourages people to live further away from, from their place of work because the, the costs of commuting are not as, as high as they should be. And therefore, in, uh, issues such as, such as uh, at, uh, at low, low fuel taxes, for example, few, few policymakers would think about issues, uh, would think about land use when they think about fuel taxes, but in the end, this has important consequences for for, for land use uh, outcomes, and this is something that that we see is is very rarely considered by by policymakers in in most of the countries that we have studied. So, with this, I would like to uh, to to finish my talk, and I would like to <coughs> hand over to, to Tamara, who will talk about uh, more detailed examples from from our work. Thank you very much. Hi. So, Abel has given this broad overview, but we have also studied some countries in depth, and I'm going to talk about those now. But before I do so, I just want to talk a little bit about our big picture. So, when we started studying this, I think we found that land is actually uh, land use, spatial planning systems, land use planning, it's a much bigger topic than we initially thought, and uh, much more complex and intertwined with other, uh, other subject areas. And so our general framework in terms of how we're thinking about these issues is that there are these institutions that are this mode of control or influence over how land is used now in the future. And this can be everything from systems of governance that are formal or informal or legislation and rules and regulations and policies. And they all create this pattern of incentives and disincentives that we've sort of discussed. And one of the most interesting things we found through these cases in the, is the importance of more sociological elements, like social trust in the society, or social norms, uh, as a, and also the, the ones you would normally think of, like uh, economic development, industrial composition, so on, socioeconomic characteristics. And all of these interact to become this complex system in terms of how we think about how land is used now in the future and how we are studying it in these case studies. 
We had the opportunity to, so far, study five cases, uh, five countries, and uh, seven metropolitan areas. So uh, Poland, we studied Łódź, which uh, is uh, actually interesting, it's population decline and post-industrial city. And France, two metropolitan areas, Clermont-Ferrand and Nancy Nazaire. In Netherlands, Amsterdam, the so-called planner's paradise. Um, in Czech Republic, Prague. And in Israel, two interesting cases, Um al Fahim, which is an, uh, in the, uh, an Arab city, and Netanya, which is on the coast. These are very different city cities, right? They, um, we have flexible versus rigid systems. Some are hierarchical, like Israel, and less hierarchical, like the Netherlands. We have places where there's very high social trust, like in the Netherlands, and that where there's very low social trust, like in uh, the Czech Republic and in Poland. And we have systems here, some are very consensus driven and some are very conflictual and litigious as a result. So there's a real, many, many differences between them. But despite all these differences, I think that there are a few governance trends to highlight. The first of which is that we're seeing that there are much more complex and participatory strategic spatial plans across a metropolitan or a regional scale. These are trying to tackle many sectoral issues in tandem, typically very medium to long-term objectives. And this relates to the second point, which is we're seeing much broader governance arrangements. We're seeing that there are far more actors involved in the elaboration of these types of plans and that the governance arrangements are much more complex. Finally, I think across all of the countries that we looked at, we saw a desire for more flexible and responsive planning systems. We really saw that the various uh, governments were struggling with how to respond to emerging challenges, be that either population growth or decline or the desires for environmental sustainability objectives and goals and so on. And they have very different approaches between them in terms of how to get there. Maybe from an American point of view, the governance trends seem a little bit out of place. If you look, for instance, at the formal planning system in the United States, uh, most plans are local. The role of regional level planning is, in general, less important than many European planning systems overall. So I'm just going to quickly go through some other planning systems. Finland, where there are national, regional, and local plans and long-term visions for development. Uh, for example, here is New Zealand, where there are also coastal plans added into the system or Mexico, where there are sectoral plans and ecological plans, and things start to look a little bit more complicated. Germany here, where you have a, quite a few sectoral plans added in. And Japan, where there are regional plans, quite a few of them, along with national, local, and sectoral ones. And finally, we end up here in the Netherlands, where, look, it's a little bit more complicated yet. So. <laughs> um, the Netherlands is really interesting because the pl there are plans at the national, regional, and local levels, and they're actually self-binding, meaning that there isn't a, you know, a binding hierarchy from one to the other. And that speaks to other things that are happening in the Le Netherlands, mostly is this kind of consensual planning system, this focus on social trust and achieving objectives and so on. So it's really interesting. These figures, of course, these are showing the formal planning system. But in each place, this doesn't illustrate, for instance, the vast number of complex governance arrangements and networks and partnerships that exist at each level to actually <coughs> guide spatial development. So it's actually much more complicated than it even looks there. So speaking of the Netherlands, uh, I, I love these case studies. I could tell you everything about them, but I don't have time. I had to pick two. So I picked Amsterdam and uh, a case in France. And this case in Amsterdam, and uh, Andrew and Amy from Lincoln Institute were joined us as peer reviewers, which was great. I think it really speaks to this desire to create a more uh, responsive and flexible planning system without, with, while maintaining environmental quality. And so Amsterdam, of course, uh, is renowned for its planning tradition. They have a very interventionist and activist role in planning in the sense that they go much beyond their statutory roles. They develop land on their own. They're even building entire new neighborhoods on self-built islands in the bay and so on. 
they have a growing economy and growing population. And so there are a lot of land use pressures uh, in Amsterdam at the moment. They will increase uh, their population by around 20% to 2040. They need to make room for 90,000 more people in what is already a reasonably dense place. They need 70, uh, room for 70,000 new hose, homes. They need spaces for living and working and green spaces and amenities and recreation to maintain quality of life. And as you can see, they're also interesting because they're one of the most polycentric regions uh, in the OECD. <clears throat> Amsterdam's development ambitions, what they're going to achieve as a city, it's intimately linked to that of their neighbors. They even have the odd, um, the odd circumstances of having an orphan neighborhood that's actually surrounded by another municipality. So they're this, this, these efforts at coordination between muni municipalities here are very, very critical. <clears throat> this is what they want to achieve, and they're already working on these goals, and I think they're kind of inspiring goals. They want to increase density. They're transforming brownfield sites and looking at building higher than they have in the past in many areas. They're transforming monofunctional areas into mixed-use ones so that people can work and shop where they live. They really want to maintain quality of life and uh, they're investing in very high quality public spaces and they are increasing accesses to green spaces and water. And perhaps most importantly and most inspiringly, if that's a word, Amsterdam's preparing for a post-fossil fuel era. They are taking on numerous tax and ta they're doing very many things and they want to be leaders in the circular economy. They're making housing stock more energy efficient. They're constructing a closed heat transfer system to transport residual heat. They're installing wind turbines, um, some political issues around that. And they're making it easier to install solar panels and so on. They've even unveiled recently their first uh, carbon neutral neighborhood. And what we find in all the places that we study is that the national or in federal states regional frameworks are really instrumental in helping cities achieve their goals. And there's something very interesting coming down the pipe in the Netherlands that I think is worth playing, paying attention to. There's this new Dutch Environmental and Planning Act. Uh, it was adopted in 2016 and municipalities will be implement, implementing it by 2018. And it came down, it came down the wire because in the Netherlands there are these long-standing debates about whether the planning system is actually holding back innovative uses. There are arguments that it hasn't been responsive enough to changing needs and trends. Um, for instance, during the 2008 economic crisis, there, were, there was an interest in expanding one of the port activities, and it took ages to do this expansion because a 3,000-page environmental assessment was required for that expansion, and it led to this ongoing debate about how can we do this better, how can we be more responsive while also maintaining our envir environmental objectives. And this was the response. The response was to merge 26 separate acts into one act and integrate all the rules and regulations across a number of policy areas. This is quite ambitious. It's for nature and water and construction and dwellings and sustainability, and they're going to be speeding up decision-making on projects. It's going to mean less rules, more discretion, more monitoring and evaluation to make, things, make sure things are on track. <clears throat> Uh, also ambitious, they're going to have one digital spatial plan for the entire country with all environmental and planning information on it. I'm, it's not entirely clear the data architecture that will support this now, but all zoning regulations and environmental laws will be accessible from this one plan. So Dutch planning is in some respects a special case. They have very high social trust uh, and levels of government seem to work together very well. but. Despite these positive changes, Dutch municipalities are still unlikely to meet their development ambitions if they're only working through planning tools alone. Some of the key issues that we see for the Netherlands is that this new act is extremely interesting. They were asking us when we studied their system whether there were comparable cases across the OECD, and I couldn't think of any. And if you can, uh, if you know of any countries that are doing something like this, I'd, I'd really like to hear from you, but I, I certainly haven't. I think they're quite innovative in this. It's going to require new ways of working and new skills for their planners. It's going to be a very iterative process in some places, for instance, in historic uh, centers, the, the types of zoning plans that exist will likely remain the same, but in other areas, they're going to have temporary and experimental uses, and this is going to require 
a very different approach on behalf of planners to working with residences and residents and monitoring change over time. Um, we also see in this case that there are growing debates in the Netherlands about the fiscal autonomy of municipalities and that maybe it should increase. And so this leads us to think that there could be an increasing role for fiscal instruments in how they may you know, achieve their spatial development objectives. And the report has some recommendations on that as well. Just before, just to, to end quickly, I'd like to mention uh, the example of France. And I think that the French case studies that we looked at really speak to the issue of how you develop coordinated strategies amongst a large number of municipalities. So just for example, this one case, Nain saint nazaire uh, on the Atlantic, it's a growing residential economy with a fragile coastal environment. The functional urban area is 108 communes, so 108 municipalities. So two of, the, two of those municipalities are large. They form the core, and then the rest are very, very small. How do you govern this space? How can these communities work together to develop a coordinated strategy? And the French planning system has a few mechanisms to do that. And they're a bit more hierarchical than anything that I think would be politically perhaps uh, achievable in the United States, but there's a very, very strong role for regions. And regions are now the lead actors for sustainable development in the country after a number of recent reforms. They've combined uh, three previous sectoral plans for transport, ecology, climate, air, and energy, and have included a waste management plan into a new plan at the regional level that the metropolitan level needs to then implement through something called a plan for territorial coherence. The plan for territorial coherence then informs the local land use plans, which in France can also be intercommunal, so multi-municipality uh, land use plans. And the region that we studied, uh, Nantes Saint Nazaire, they have a, a plan for territorial coherence. They developed it in 2007. 60 uh, municipalities were involved. It was a very large uh, coordination effort. And they evaluated it recently, and they found that it was very effective in, in meeting the challenges that they faced, the most important of which was growing peri-urbanization, large residential economy very fast peri-urbanization in this area, and this plan was achieving its objectives in that regard. But the French case offers some lessons for others, and it also raises some issues. And one of the issues is that as this type of planning, these integrated, comprehensive plans that tackle a number of sectoral issues, as this becomes the norm, that leads to different capacities amongst the actor, actors involved. And there's a risk that it becomes a very technocratic uh, endeavor and that local communities don't feel engaged in the process and can't actually implement the outcomes on the ground because they aren't engaged. It also raises the issue of the need to enhance the monitoring and the management of peri-urban zones most critically where the vast amount of development is happening in France and the, and the vast amount of conflict. And finally, we saw, as we've seen in so many of our, our cases, is a need to combine both regulatory and economic incentives to meet spatial goals. And finally, especially in the French case, to enhance vertical coordination amongst the different uh, bodies, national, regional, and local. Altogether, there's so much depth in these case studies, but I think they raise some overarching questions for us questions that the planning system commonly faces, which is how do you balance this desire for a flexible and adaptive system against the need for certainty and fairness? And we see some really interesting approaches across our cases in terms of how you achieve that. All of our cases have also raised this issue of scale. What is the best scale at which to tackle some of these uh, strategic problems? What is, what is gained and what is lost when you take it to a more regional versus a local level? How do you balance all of these competing demands, uh, environmental sustainability, social equity, affordable housing, and so on? How do you resolve conflict, and what are the best ways to resolve conflict? And there are some very unique mechanisms we've seen, including mechanisms at the national level to help the local governments resolve conflict in France. And finally, when and how to engage with whom? It's kind of an overarching issue we, we see across our cases. As a final remark, I just want to say, we feel that there is a great deal to be learned across these comparative studies, even though they're so different. Um, and we really hope to do more cases in the future. We particularly uh, welcome learning about these issues from, from American cities. 
And uh, thank you so much for your time, for listening, and we'll open the floor up to questions now. Thanks. So I want to thank uh, uh, Abel and Tamara for a great uh, presentation. Um, and um, I'm going to invite uh, Bob Treese and Andy Rashofsky to join us up here. For, we're going to start um, the discussion, and then we're going to hopefully um, uh, get you to uh, participate in the discussion of kind of the report and, and really about the, some of the broader kind of issues that are addressed in the report, like the, the challenge of balancing public and private interests uh, through land use governance. It's not actually the simplest thing to think about. And just to kind of motivate that, I want to just give you a quick story about um, something that I was involved in about 10 years ago. I was asked by the Ford Foundation to propose the next generation of community and economic development work that should be done in philanthropy. And in order to do that, they asked us to take a look at the development of the community economic, uh, community and economic uh, development space over the last 30, 40 years. Really starting, I guess, with the war on poverty and the, the riots in the cities in the 1960s, culminating in things like the creation of HUD and everything else. But from the side of philanthropy, what they did was they said, their analysis was that you know, urban decline was a result of the capital starvation to communities. The inability of private and public capital to make it into inner city neighborhoods and, the, and leading to, of course, the depopulation of them and the, the general you know, decline of them. And so their, their answer to it was actually an institutional answer. They said, we need to build a bridge. And this bridge has to bring capital from the public and private sector back into neighborhoods. And that bridge was called a CDC, a Community Development Corporation. And so through the, about 30 years of, and billions of dollars of investment, the creation of intermediaries to bring capital to uh, these CDCs, we went from six CDCs in 1969 to about 3,000 CDCs in the 1990s. What was interesting about that is these CDCs you know, individually had great stories, and when you added it up, they did gigantic volumes of work, including passing signature kinds of legislation like the Community Reinvestment Act in 1976, or the, um, the tax reforms of 1986, which resulted in something like the Low Income Housing Tax Credit that was responsible for building 2.4 million units of housing over 20 years. The problem was when we actually stood back and, and took a look at that, we had to uh, conclude um, a disappointing thing. That although we had started the process trying to find a way to deal with land use problems in inner cities, and something that we know a lot about, the concentration of poverty in US cities, after 30 plus years of that work, building two and a half million units of housing and in, in incredible amounts of investment of human and uh, labor and capital, we had to conclude that we'd actually somehow exacerbated the concentration of poverty over those 30 or 40 years, which is something that was really devastating to find out. And when we, th we asked why, we, we finally had to conclude that it was because we had kind of missed an important component of how these things kind of unfolded over time, which was the rules of the game. And the rules of the game were kind of uh, really preventing us from doing the right thing. So when we asked, well, why was it that we built two and a half million units of affordable housing using the low income housing tax credit and we exacerbated the concentration of poverty? It's because the rules dictated where you would build. And when you asked any of the people who were building this, uh, this housing, they would say, well, we have to build where the, where the land is cheap, and we have to build where we're not going to face stiff opposition from local NIMBYs to prevent us from doing the work. So where did they build? Well, where there was already affordable housing. And so you built more affordable housing on top of affordable housing. And the rules of the game go as far as the, the, the very localized land use planning that prevent us from actually being able to, to address the concentration of poverty at the metropolitan scale. So we heard about France with 108 communities in this area of, of, of Nantes, right, that work together on a municipal plan. That sounds like Boston to me. What is it, Boston, 101 little communities in a metro area? And how well have we been able to work together as a region in Boston to address the concentration of poverty? Not so well, right? So it's just interesting to think about because sometimes, you know, you think kind of, the frontal assault is the right way to go, 
when you're trying to deal with things. And if, and if the frontal assault on trying to find ways to bring capital to community is, the, is to just find a bridge to bring capital to community, maybe you can do something that we'd never contemplated when we started that work, which was you can take an intervention to scale without having scaled impact. And that's a horrible thing to think about. So with that, I want to actually offer Bob and, and uh, Andy a chance to think or to, to opine about the, the report. They've been able to take a look at the report, see the, um, see the presentation, and, and to think a little bit about what do you see are the challenges of balancing public and private interests in land, dealing with the unintended consequences of land governance or the unintended consequences of fiscal or monetary policies and how they might play out on the ground. So maybe we'll start with you, Bob, and you might give us a few reflections, and then we'll move to Andy. Bob, thanks very take much, it away. Jack, and um, th thanks just for the introduction, also for the invitation to be here with you today. So thanks generally to Lincoln, and also for the OECD for producing what I think is an excellent report. Um, Max said I'd uh, talk, and, among other things, about um, kind of the role of fiscal and monetary policy. And I'm, I'm not going to do that. I'm with the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston. Uh, I should say right away that anything I say is just my own view, not the view of the Federal Reserve System or the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston. And right now in Washington, D.C., there is a meeting of the Federal Open Market Committee. And um, I cannot say anything that's related to monetary policy because of the policy sensitivity of the, the timing of this event. So. Um, Bob, that's not going to keep me from asking you a question about maybe your regulatory authority, but go ahead. But well, keep me from answering. <laughs> all right, that's fine. <laughs> but sure, ask. So, so I would like to say, you know, first of all, is the, um, you know, I think this is an excellent report. And, you know, one thing that um, from an economist perspective, I'm an economist, is that we, we tend to think about, you know, the guidance given us by Adam Smith in The Wealth of Nations, that there's this power of markets that markets guide us to socially optimal pattern of activity as though being guided by an invisible hand. And it's not clear Adam Smith really meant what the way people have often interpreted him. But in labor economics, where I do much of my work, there's a saying that when it comes to the labor market, the invisible hand is all thumbs. And <laughs> I think that applies as well to land use planning. And I think the, the report really you know, documents and goes through how land use is um, rife with examples of externalities and public goods that economists know result in market failures and that there need to be supportive policies that prevent, the, that basically correct those types of market failures. So the most obvious ones are things like the, the problems of congestion and sprawl, pollution, including uh, carbon emissions. And there it's clear that we need policies, not only you know, at the land use level, but also support of fiscal policies as in the form of things like motor vehicle taxes um, or repeal perhaps of a mortgage interest deduction to try to address those, those, pro those problems, externalities, and public goods. Um, so, so there, I think, you know, the, the report is right on. It's, it's, you know, there's a lot that we do, not only in terms of land use planning, but I think the real, one of the real innovations the report is talking about, you know, we really need to be using fiscal instruments that go well belong, beyond um, land use. So in the debate in Washington about how to reform the federal tax system and what role the interest deduction will, um, mortgage interest deduction will play, that has implications for land use. That's something that it should be, you know, part of the discussion as to what role do will that have on land use. Now, one, one thing I want to talk a little bit about is how I think there, there are really two focus areas of the kind of the policy aspects of land use. Um, and there, there's kind of two big, one of the two big um, policy issues of our day, that being sustainability and inequality. Because so sustainability, I think, is where much of the report is focused in terms of, you know, how to make communities that are denser, that rely less on, on fossil-based fuels, that are more sustainable in the face of the environmental challenges we face in the future. Now, the, the other thing is um, inequality. And here I think the report, you know, talks about that, but perhaps not as directly, that land use makes a big difference in the distribution of economic well-being among people in a country or in, um, in a commuting zone. And there I think the, um, some different tools might be needed than those are used to promote sustainability. 
So here, um, things come to mind were um, policies, things like inclusive zoning, or something like the BPDA's um, inclusionary development policy, were which arguably <coughs> could be viewed as value capture, were in exchange for being able to develop a new area, some of that value associated with the, some of the increase in property value associated with the development right is captured in the form of the obligation to create this, um, affordable housing units. Um, I think we could go a lot, and I guess the, the uh, example uh, Mac just gave of the federal LIHTC program is another example of kind of a, a policy that promotes the development of more affordable housing. Uh, I, th I think we could go further in this realm, though. Um, in many areas, there's a problem that the market forces on their own would suggest that the most profitable housing developed is luxury housing. There are policies that are designed to promote housing for um, low-income um, populations, but the market force is kind of missing the middle of that sphere, the, those kind of um, types of housing that appeal most to, to kind of middle-income uh, families. Um, Another area, so I think there, there needs to be more kind of work on trying to develop those types of policies that, that are not only designed to increase housing supply overall, which is a good thing, but the right type of housing supply taking distributional considerations into account. Um, another area, I, I, I think, is to align in here not only the interests of developers with where public policy would like development to go, but the, the interest in municipalities, this deals with intergovernmental fiscal relations. So in Massachusetts, as we one often hears that um, there's certain types of new development that's going to cause a deterioration in a municipality's finances. So for example, new development that has is relatively moderately priced, so generates relatively little in the way of new property taxes, but attracts people who have placed a fairly heavy burden on municipal services is something that towns tend to shy away from. So for example, housing that will attract families with school-aged kids will increase the expenditures in municipalities quite a bit through extra school expenditures. The amount of revenue brought in from that new construction may not you know, be up to the level of new expenditures that are caused. And so that causes towns sometimes either the reality or perception of that to shy away from improving new development. So that's something that I think needs to be addressed, not necessarily through land use planning, but through kind of the fiscal um, policies um, at, the, at the state level. So, so I think in terms of where to push, you know, kind of the arguments in the report, I'd say inequality is one area. Um, another area I'd say would be, we should think a little bit about what future challenges we know are coming and how the public sector may be in a better position to respond to those future challenges now than the private sector is in terms of development. Okay, so, so I'll list um, three hopefully very quickly. One is the development of autonomous vehicles. Now, it's, it's actually kind of humbling, I think, to think about when we're thinking about um, plans for new development or new urban structure, by the time stuff on the planning board now comes online, there will be autonomous vehicles on the street. Hopefully under pretty good control and not hitting people, but they'll definitely be there. They're already there in experimental phase. And this has big implications for land use planning, particularly for things like parking, where, where parking garages are put, type of requirements for parking for new development. It also implications for things like the street layouts, how wide streets should be, whether there should be streets set aside for autonomous vehicles during a transitionary period where they might be best just on certain types of corridors, or perhaps not mixed with drivers like myself who might not interact well with them. <laughs> there is an um, element of, of distributional equity in this, in that the autonomous vehicles have the, you know, could result in a situation where public transit loses much of a space if people start taking autonomous Uber cars rather than MBTA buses. So there's a need to look to planning to figure out how to make sure that there isn't some part of the population that loses out in this transition. Okay, so that's one area. The next one, we should think about autonomous um, boats as well, and that um, because we know with climate change, <laughs> even if we take, you know, address the issues now, there are going to be areas like where we see out the window here, with a lot of new development in the Seaport District, 
where in a few decades there's going to be water on the streets, so maybe autonomous boats are the way to get around. <laughs> um, but regardless, it's something we need to think about now in terms of planning, not in terms of the way things are built, but also how do we develop new fiscal instruments, whether based on things like value capture or land taxation, that will raise the revenue needed for new infrastructure to make areas like the seaport more resilient to climate change and rising sea levels. Because we know there's going to be a huge amount of investment that's needed. Right now, we really don't have the instruments to generate the revenue needed for investment. That's an area where I think we need a lot of um, innovation. Okay, very quickly, the third, this one gets particularly close to home for me. I think we need to think about the implications of an aging population on land use. Okay, so here this, we know that the needs of an aging population will differ somewhat from those of a younger population. And so when we're thinking about land use, the ability to have older people housed near um, healthcare services, alternative transit services, things like that, will be important in terms of not only the quality of life that the population will experience, but also there'll be fiscal externalities associated with that. To the extent that land use can result in the older population remaining largely self-sufficient in homes and not having to go to specialized institutions, there'll be you know, potentially enormous benefits in terms of public health expenditures for things like on the Medicaid program. So that's, I think, so in addition to all the other challenges the OECD team laid out for us, I think those are some ones that we can consider. Thanks, Bob. And, and it is, um, it's useful to think about the, the idea of planning forward. But the other thing we have to think about is that right now we inhabit buildings, many of which were built 50, 100, 150, if you're in Paris 300 years ago. Um, and um, the duration of, the, of our building stock is something that we need to take into account when we think about, oh, something as simple as densification, because we all know it's not that simple, right? Um, so Andy, you have a, how about a little bit of tax policy? <laughs> okay, I'll try to talk about taxes a little bit. Um, I'd like to s start by recommending to everyone in, in the room that you read the report, um, Governance Land Use. It's really very interesting, extremely well done, raises a whole range of, of important and interesting issues, only some of which were uh, addressed in, in the oral presentation. Uh, it, what, what particularly struck me is the really focus on incentives uh, created by policies, and some of them obviously the traditional land use policies, and then a whole range of incentives created by fiscal policies, tax policies, other policies that influence land use and the demand, demand for land. And what I wanted to do is uh, talk about three um, specific policies, giving some maybe policy alternatives uh, that are particularly salient for, for Americans. Um, maybe more so than the average OECD country. And, and these are, well, I'll start with the mortgage interest deduction, which has been talked about a lot. And uh, just remind you that it's been in the news in the last week because the president came out with a new tax plan that talked about broadening the base, meaning getting rid of deductions and, and lowering the rates. But one thing in his uh, proposal was we're going to maintain the mortgage interest deduction. And, uh, you know, we have a ample evidence, lots of research that shows that the mortgage interest deduction, which is supposed to and is justified by increasing home ownership rates, does nothing of the kind. It has almost no impact on increasing home ownership. Most of the benefits go to people who would be homeowners anyway. What it does is, as Mac pointed out, uh, just increases to, lar uh, to people buying more expensive, larger houses, has an impact on um, land use by people moving to the suburbs and, and, and the exurbs. Um, a, um, a, a few years ago, um, the Boston Federal Reserve Bank published uh, a book where uh, both I and, and Bob had papers in called Smart Subsidies for Community Development. And with a, with a co-author, we looked at the mortgage interest deduction and who, who benefited, and we thought about what are alternatives. And one alternative that, that we talked about and other people have talked about is moving to a refundable credit. And that, that basically shifts the benefits, the tax savings from the mortgage interest deduction away from people who have big houses to people people who are maybe not now homeowners, but could become homeowners. Um, the, the, 
the problem is that uh, the people who have the big houses, who also have lots of political power and, and, and wealth, will oppose that. So our very much second best uh, solution was to say, let's have an optimal uh, refundable credit. So you would have a choice of which one to keep. So people could keep their benefits, but at least we would uh, provide an incentive for more home ownership among those people who now are, are not homeowners. Uh, that's not my ideal plan, but uh, until we can find a way politically in the United States to weaken uh, the power of the forces that want to maintain the mortgage interest deduction, that maybe is the best we could do. Um, Second example also mentioned uh, uh, several times is, is the gasoline tax. Um, and in the United States, the, there's a federal gasoline tax, and each state has a gasoline tax. The federal gasoline tax rate is 18.4 cents per gallon. Uh, that hasn't changed since October 1993. Uh, a number of states, some have recently been raising the gas tax. That's the good news. Other states have uh, not moved their, increased their gas tax in many years. In fact, in Massachusetts, it's um, in 2014, uh, the voters in all their wisdom decided that uh, they would roll back or uh, eliminate an indexing for inflation of, of the gas tax. Uh, so we've seen both sides. Uh, the only thing, I, the reason I think to be a little optimistic maybe that policy might change is the fact that gasoline, uh, gasoline petroleum prices are low and that's the main way we've been funding infrastructure, road infrastructure, particularly in the United States. And so there's growing pressure to think about uh, raising taxes. Uh, some states have actually done it. Some states are beginning to play with the idea of a mileage-based tax. That obviously would have important land use implications. If, uh, it's become much more expensive to live on the periphery and, and work in the center. So we'll also see where that goes. Um, thir third example. Uh, in, in the United States, we have a very highly fragmented political structure within metropolitan areas and a heavy, rel heavy relative to most OECD countries uh, reliance on local funding of public services, local government funding. Uh, and uh, com combined, those, those uh, two things lead uh, governments uh, to try to attract businesses, try to attract high-income individuals uh, by competing in terms of tax policy and fiscal policy. We'll give you a tax break or we'll have lower tax rates than they have in the central cities. Come move out to the periphery. Uh, that leads to less densification. It leads often to patterns of development which don't make any sense for the metropolitan area as a whole in terms of environment, in terms of congestion costs, in terms of pollution and, and, and so forth. And um, uh, in, in I'll just an example that's already mentioned, 101 local governments in the Boston metropolitan area, um, but uh, Chicago takes the prize with, uh, believe it or not, 1,550 <laughs> independent local governments within the Chicago metropolitan area. Uh, lots of lots of fragmentation made worse because. Uh, the fiscalization of land use, which comes from the fact that we so rely so heavily on local uh, taxation for the for the funding of public services. So, so what's what's possible as a solution? Solutions are obviously hard politically. Um, you know, a few metropolitan areas in the United States have gone to metropolitan governance. Nashville, Tennessee, is one one example. Um, that's hard, but they're. You know, there have been a few positive examples. There's some middle ground examples, uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul, the Twin Cities areas come to mind with one, a tax base sharing scheme where some of the benefits of uh, Get, attracting new growth gets shared in a central pool. Minneapolis, St. Paul also has a regional government called the Metropolitan Council, which has its own taxing power, very rare in the United States, and has a lot of control over where infrastructure gets built in the metropolitan area. Um, if, if we could get more metropolitan areas to sort of mimic what's happened in the Twin Cities, that, that would be a really good thing. Um, the third area, um, that I've spent quite a bit of time talking about is the intergovernmental transfer system. And here I mean mainly the state transferring money to local governments. And they do that for education and for general purpose governments. And in many cases, 
In every state, there's a different story. But in many cases, the formulas that the states use to allocate money actually, um, I think, have land use implications because they favor uh, new areas. They favor rather than the central cities. Central cities have to provide services. They have concentrations of poor individuals. They have higher costs of delivering services. Uh, that ought to be part of the distribution allocation formulas that that allocate aid. And in many cases, they they are not. So in an implicit way, the w the way their transfer system works in the United States works to just exacerbate uh, de-densification. I guess. Um, is a way to put it. And um, maybe I'll stop there. <laughs> so I'll just add, Andy, to that the, um, the challenge that cities have where so much of their land is untaxable because it's owned by government, by or nonprofit organizations, hospitals, universities, and even the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy. <laughs> and, you know, that becomes actually a burden for those places because their own source revenues are limited and then they're punished uh, from above as well in the intergovernmental transfers. So I, I want to give our authors a, 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 you know, a couple minutes to kind of respond to these observations. I want to plant two more questions. So um, in our work around the Atlas of Urban Expansion, which is um, a global view of um, the, the growth of cities from 1990 to 2015, one of the, the main conclusions, and this, this is a sample of 200 cities, it's not just in OECD countries, they're all over the world, but they concluded that um, Land use in cities was growing faster than the population at a factor of 1.5 to 1. So meaning that if you doubled the population of a city, you'd triple its land size on average over that, over that period, right? And so this kind of contradicts your observation, at least with OECD countries, that as on a per capita basis, land use is actually um, falling over time. And so I wonder, if it, is, it, is that a, an issue of representativeness of our global sample versus the OECD sample, or is it something else? So that's one question. And then the other question is, and this is just pattern recognition, um, you noted that uh, in places where the, the growth of um, or increasing land use um, was also an indicator of um, severity of the um, financial bubble. And I'm wondering, could we use that to track or to pot potentially predict um, um, land use or, or price bubbles in, in land markets by just looking at the, the, the development pace of land? Or is there some an analysis that we should do to kind of look at that? All right, so you've heard a lot back from us. You can start answering those questions. The people in the audience, if you have questions, there are microphones, and I think they're going to be circulating around. Lourdes has one in the back. So indicate, and Jenna has one here, indicate if you have a, a question, and I will let, I'll turn the floor over. The Abel, Tamara, Rüdiger. Go for it. Okay. Um, <coughs> first of all, uh, thank thank you very much for for your interventions. Um, I will I will come back to them in, in a second. In in general, I think I we perfectly agree with literally everything everything <laughs> you said. So the, these were very good points, and uh, I think we're per perfectly in line. So maybe uh, let me just start out with the the two two issues that you mentioned. Um, First, the, the the data issue that that you say that uh, that the, the per capita use of developed land has actually been growing. Um, I think the, the the figures that that we presented they they don't necessarily contradict this. So what what we what we have shown was that the per capita land use in in, in urban areas only, um, and urban areas have been have been areas that have been growing particularly in in population. But of course, when we when we look across basically all OECD countries, we also see that there are lot, lots of areas where population has actually been declining. So so people have been have been moving away from from regions, and I think I don't I don't know the the exact numbers. They should be in the report. I think we have. When we look at, at the 1,700 different regions across the OECD, we have more than three or 400 uh, in which population has been declining. But less than 40 regions actually have decreased uh, their absolute uh, amount of developed land. So one pattern that we can observe is that even when, when people move away from a region, the amount of developed land rarely, I mean, almost almost never go, goes down. So the only the only real systematic uh, reduction in the in developed land in, in response to, to de population decline 
has actually occurred in, in Eastern Germany after, after the German reunification. But otherwise, it's extremely rare that the amount of, of developed land actually goes down. And that, of course, it's, it's not only an environmental problem, but it also creates um, uh, creates uh, important important fiscal uh, fiscal problems to to those uh, local governments that face population decline because they are basically stuck with infrastructure that was built for much much larger population and they still have to have to fund this uh, this infrastructure even though their their population uh, is is declining and their tax base is probably uh, lower than it was at than at the point when this infrastructure was built so so but coming coming back to your point i mean when what what we see is that of course when people move away from from one region and and land is not returned to an undeveloped state but new land is developed in the in the in the areas in the cities where the, the people are, are moving to then of course we see that the the overall amount of developed land is is uh, going up um just maybe uh, talking very briefly about the the sect issue that you that you mentioned whether we can use um, the the increase in developed land as an as an indicator for for housing bubbles. Um, I, I mean, there, there's a huge debate about uh, among economists whether it's possible to to predict the bubbles or not. And some would say that by definition, bubble is not uh, is not predictable. Um, I think in general, what we what we should uh, we should see. I mean, we, we should take it as an alarm sign if we see that the amount of uh, that developed land is increasing much faster than than uh, population. I mean, this is if we see this this kind of disparity, then then we should should uh, start to wonder whether something is potentially going wrong at the same uh, at, the, at this place. And I would also say say this this works the other way around. If we see a situation like, for example, London, where where population has been has been increasing by more than a million over the past 25 years, and at the same time we do not see any increase in development. Yeah. And we could also think think of as a as a uh, cause cause for for alarm because uh, might also be a sign that that some some uh, response that should should be occurring is not not occur occurring to the degree it should be. Um, so now I've spoken already a lot. I, I don't know. Do you do you want to? <clears throat> I would just to remark uh, the the point you made, Robert, about the focus on inequality. Yes, I think that's such a critical uh, critical issue that we'd like to say a lot more on, and we'd like to do some studies that look in particular in depth at housing and land use policies. I should have remarked uh, when I was speaking earlier that each one of our country studies of different cases, those are all a separate manuscript, and those have given a those are separate reports, and that has given us a chance to look into some of these issues in depth. Um, Amsterdam, uh, for instance, they're shifting, f just as one example, they're shifting from a system where there's been a very uh, large share of social housing, which isn't social housing in the sense that you would think of. It was middle class housing. It was more than 70% in Amsterdam. It's going down very quickly. And they're struggling with that issue you remarked about is where is middle class housing going to uh, then happen in that city? And they're trying to tackle that head on and they're trying to tackle it by creating spaces for new middle class and more affordable housing in the city. So we have some interesting examples, but I think it deserves its own substantive focus because when we delve into it, we find these are such complicated issues and you need to be quite a housing policy expert to do them justice yeah thank you if if, if i may just add, add one small point regarding uh, what you said uh, about the fiscal uh, about the incentives that the, the fiscal system of a country provides for for local land use policies i think this is a it's a, is a it's an excellent point that that you mentioned and we we um have observed it quite frequently and i think that the literature also provides uh, important examples how, how this plays out in in practice. So, for example, we we have observed when we were in Israel that local governments there uh, collect a particularly large share of their of their their taxes from from businesses. So, of course, they have uh, the incentive to to zone as much land for for commercial development as possible. I mean, uh, Switzerland is an example where we see that local governments rely a lot on on uh, on local income taxes so of course they are interested in attracting residents and not only any resident but of course uh, particularly like high, high high income residents um one argument why why uh, so little development has been has been going on in the in the uk in in recent years and and uh 
why why this has led to to to, to rising like, extremely strongly rising housing costs in in the UK is that local local governments face barely any incentive to 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 develop new land because in the end it it actually creates a slightly more costs than than it, it creates uh, revenues for them so why should should local governments uh, zone any land for for development if this is probably something which is not liked by 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 their residents if it does not uh, Add to their to their to their fiscal health. So so I think this is an extremely extremely important point. And uh, when we when we speak to to, to local policymakers, we see that they that local policymakers are generally of course aware of the different incentives that they face uh, in in making their decision. But at a, at a more systematic level, this it's it's not often it, it's not not. Not as well understood to to what degree this the the, the fiscal system actually contributes to to particular uh, land use patterns. So I think that's a that's it's, it's a very good point. We have a. Oh, do you want to? Yeah, I just wanted to add, add one point. I mean, especially given that we're here in a place where there's a lot of education institutions. Um, I mean, one one of the problems really is that, um, and then we've been, we've we've repeatedly been talking about that is really that I mean the. Um, the, the the incentives that are coming out out of the fiscal systems and the tax systems I mean they're often working you know at cross purposes to the uh, to the intended purposes of the urban planning and and one of the reasons why that is the case is actually that um, urban planners economists don't know a lot about the profession of each other and also often don't talk very much to, to another and just give you like like one example when we're doing our case studies then we're kind of like asking the we're, we're mainly in contact with the um, planning departments we're asking them look when we're coming would please can you please invite your people from your fiscal department so they can also talk with them so most of the cases I mean these people didn't show up so uh, half of the cases the urban planners didn't invite them because they thought they were useless and the other half of the cases the fiscal <laughs> the fiscal people didn't come because they thought what they were doing is totally unrelated to land use they didn't see the point in showing up. And what this reflect in a way is kind of like a, a larger non understanding between the, the professions of economists and urban planners and I must say that I mean Robert here on the table really is an exception because I mean I, I, I'm myself by training I'm an economist I can tell you that a lot of economists really don't know much about urban and they haven't really understood about all the externalities and all the reasons why you need urban planning and they, they think well, well the market will fix it and well, why, why, why are we talking about the issue and then you know, on the other hand I mean a lot of urban planners I mean they've never you know really had like a macro course or a course on economic I mean public finance and they really they, they just react like, like incentives don't matter and then obviously I mean kind of like I mean the, you get these, these these problems where kind of like I mean you have these you know the systems working cross purpose and then the outcomes I mean I mean when you're talking with urban planners a lot of them are frustrated because they're telling we're doing all these beautiful plans and they never never really get implemented and uh, it's not really surprising if all the financial incentives are kind of like biased against your plan then of course you know in, in the end of the day basically money wins I mean that's, that's not really surprising so what we really think it's really important that the there should be more of a dialogue between basically the, the economic profession and the urban planning profession. We're trying to promote that in the OECD, but we also think it's very important that kind of in a way it gets promoted really at the start, basically when people are in university. And, and we would very strongly encourage basically to kind of like make sure that when economists, I mean, get out, that they had had you know, at least a bit of urban economics and that they understand that in cities there are so complex issues that the market is not going to fix it. They need some urban planning basically. And on the other hand, in the urban planning profession, that they have some basic understanding how public finances work and that they know, you know, basically what incentive structures do to outcomes. To Rudiger, it's, um, as an economist, I can tell you it's no mystery to me why people don't want to talk to economists, right? <laughs> uh, and also, you know, as part of our municipal fiscal health campaign, we, um, we asked our partner uh, organization, the American Planning Association, to do a straw poll of planning schools to see how many of the planning schools that offer advanced degrees in planning require any kind of public finance uh, for their masters or PhD students. And what percentage do you think, at least in the United States, require any kind of zero? zero exactly. <laughs> and so there's the problem, right? I mean, then, and, and frankly, uh, you know, the public finance people don't necessarily know a lot about planning either. So we could, it goes both ways. So we have a question over here from um, Enrique. Hi, uh, Enrique Sullivan from the Lincoln Institute. Thank you very much for um, presenting the, these wonderful reports and really providing so much food for thought. Um, with governance, one of the things that we actually didn't hear too much about, and I'm curious to hear from your, your work and the cases, is um, leadership. Who or what 
is leading yeah. the planning agenda. And in, in particular, I'm really more, in, I'm interested in who or what is legitimizing or trying to legitimize the urban just land policy and urban issues at this level. Um, I think we've heard a lot about actors, agencies, the rules of the games, but you know, who are the leaders and who should we support? And again, it's individuals or institutions. Thank you. That's a tricky question. Yeah, that's, that's, that's <laughs> a, I think I think the, the, the yeah. So first of all, I think this this is a very very context specific question, and it's it's quite difficult to to argue uh, to to give a general answer to it. And secondly, I think we also have to to distinguish between what we think should be the case and what is often the case in in practice. I think. Um, of course, we we know we all know that that planning should be a participatory exercise. That we uh, all the stakeholders should should be involved in planning, and I think this is something that is it's of course nothing new. And I think this is something that that uh, basically all the planners that we are talking to they 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 they, they, they are aware of this principle. But of course, it's uh, it's not something that is always easy to implement and practice. And uh, and we we see huge differences. Uh, how this actually, how this turns out in, 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 in practice and whether this, whether we, we see that these participatory uh, processes work in practice. So we see some, some places where this uh, works out very well. I mean, uh, Tamara mentioned, mentioned Amsterdam. I mean, that's, that's uh, obviously a very good example, but then we also see uh, some other countries where, where this is not working out as, as well as it uh, should, should be working out. And, um, in general, I'm talking in particular about the, the, the question of leadership. Um, of course, what matters a lot to, to really see leadership from, from the very top, so to, to see leadership from, 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 the, from the mayor. So if the mayor is, is, uh, is a strong advocate of, of something, I mean, this is, is of course, what, what matters the most. Uh, in general, I think what, what also matters is uh, it's not only political leadership but it's also leadership from from different community groups because it's it's the, the, the if community groups have have a have a strong voice and and can actually actively demand a participatory process and can 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 actively demand to be involved in the planning process that already goes goes a long way to towards making planning not only a, a technocratic exercise but making it a truly participatory process <clears throat> I think I would, just to add to that, um, again, it depends on the cases, but I see a lot of risks with the types of overarching strategic plans and also the risks of aspects of, of land use planning become more complex. It becomes this technocratic exercise. And I think what we're seeing in our case in Prague is that um, the technocratic aspects have dominated to the detriment of the fact that this is really a political agenda and that there's risk that their new metropolitan plan won't be implemented because of that. So we cannot ignore that these are political documents, right? And uh, there's a huge risk that with some of the large, complex, multi-sectoral metropolitan plans, kind of like you see in France, for instance, that there's very little connection to people's lives and they don't understand what this is as a political body because it's not really a political body as well. It's multiple metropoles and intercommunalities negotiating a common strategic development agenda for you know to 15 to 20 year perspective it's not an actual governance mechanism of governance or political mechanism as there's, there's real risks in that approach and yet they're effective too sometimes so again yeah it's a good question can, can I add something? I mean, <clears throat> given that that's, that it's such a um, complex issue, I think political leadership is, is certainly important and in certain cases will also work, but um, it can only go so far, basically. And, and, and one of the problems really is governance structures matter a lot when you come to these more more technical questions, which you can't really easily explain to everybody on the street, basically. And, and what we've been showing is really that these, these municipal fragmentation that you're having in metropolitan areas where you have often, like, I mean, several dozens and even several hundreds of municipalities in one metropolitan area that can be really a large burden um, on, on getting um, good good planning and um, 
a lot of, lot of I mean, it's, actually, actually, we've been showing that it has a lot of negative effects. We've been showing that it has a negative effect on economic productivity, that it typically is this correlated with, with worse public transport. You have higher pollution levels when you're having more municipal fragmentation. You're having more segregation. I mean, you're having worse outcomes on a whole range of well-being issues and productivity issues. And um, so one thing that we think is really important in these in, in metropolitan areas is uh, not not just to hope that political leadership will solve everything but also kind of like creating the governance structures that then are conducive to to this leadership maybe emerging or also kind of like in the absence of this leadership i mean better outcomes coming out of that and uh, that means basically that somehow for a certain range of issues that should be taken with the whole metropolitan area in view, and, and land use decisions and transport uh, planning decisions are typically, I mean, very prominent in, in that area. Um, somehow, you need to make sure that they're not taken by, you know, 120 mayors, which all have their very small constituency in mind, but they are somehow taken with a view for the whole metropolitan area. There's certain, there's different types of solutions you can invent. It depends very much on what your situation is, what your uh, historical, I mean, background is, what kind of the policy constraints you may have. But I mean, if this is not tackled, I mean, then you'll be systematically coming up with solutions that are much, much worse than what could be the, the, the desired, I mean, publicly desired, I mean, optimal outcome. Come and and um, and political leadership will only be, I mean, be able to go a very small way in, in addressing this this fundamental structural problem. So, could you um, introduce yourself? Uh, um. uh, Bill Valletta is my name. Um, I want to go back, Abel, to the um, three slides that you showed at the beginning of your presentation. One of them was um, the uh, per capita land use in the various metropolitan areas. The second was, was the growth per capita. And the first one, the United States was on the left side and was real high. Second one, the United States was on the right side and was real low. And then you showed the affordability housing uh, uh, slide where the United States was in the middle and Sweden was on the top and Japan was on the bottom. I, I, I assume we're supposed to be seeing some correlation between the first two and the third one, but I'm not getting it. And why the, is, does the pattern of the way the countries in the first slide in terms of their, you know, the amount of land per capita per, per person in the metropolitan area, what does that have to do ultimately then with the housing costs? So, and and is, uh, yeah. is there, does the pattern match in some way or is it just not, does the cost factor just not have anything to do with the... <laughs> we, we, we actually see that this, uh, this, this the, exactly the, the correlation that you mentioned, we see actually, we uh, even have it in the presentation, if you just click a bit forward. Uh -huh. Yeah, the, the, no, this one. This one, yeah. This this one. This, oh. this is this is ex actually that's that's exactly the the correlation, and we see that ah. it's a strong and statistically significant correlation, but it's far from a perfect correlation. So we have, for example, uh, one one outlier uh, one outlier to the to the bottom left, which is which yeah. is Ireland, which is experienced um, in at least in the the time period that is covered by this data, which which focuses primarily on the the post post housing bubble. Uh, which has experienced quite a decline in house prices, but at the same time uh, has did not did not experience uh, did not uh, did not experience much growth in in developed lands. So, um, so sorry, I hope the, this might might have been a bit uh, a bit confusing. But but to to put a long story short, I think short I think we we see exactly the the correlation that that you're mentioning. So we see that that countries who who have less uh, who add less developed land for 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 growing population see stronger uh, stronger house price house price in increases. I think this is also something that we see uh, within the United States when we when we looked at uh, when we look at ha uh, house house price developments. Then we see that that metropolitan areas that have that have traditionally very expansive uh, uh, land use policies, uh, for example, in in the in the south. That they have uh, experienced much uh, much smaller increases in, in house prices than than uh, metropolitan areas that have much much more restrictive uh, uh, land land use policies. Uh, for example, here here in the northeast or, or in the in, in, in on the on along the, the west coast. So I think there 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 this pattern is clearly there that you mentioned. But uh, of course, it's it's far from perfect. And I think our message should be that uh, land land use policies. Um, 
definitely play a role in, in determining house prices. And I know you don't want to talk about monetary policy, but um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think that there, there we have an, another uh, policy field, which probably is uh, also uh, not, uh, which probably also influences this, this kind of uh, rise in house prices that we, we have uh, have observed over the past uh, past years. I think it's not a coincidence that a period of, of historically low uh, interest rates has coincided with uh, drastic rises in, in, in house prices. Uh, my name is Gerald Milroy, and I'm an urban planner, and I want to follow up on the prior conversation. First of all, I, I want to thank you for the invitation for this event because it is terrific, and it's my basically the introduction, if you will, to uh, OECD and, and their role, and uh, I've worked in Washington with the Congressional Commission at the federal level, state and local level as well. And I, and I, I guess my, I uh, would say welcome to the world of urban and regional planning, and uh, it fundamentally, it seems to me, is what happens in these ex case studies as well as here in the United States, is you have this competition between people who are one of protecting their property rights and at the same time, they are also the same people who are complaining about property taxes. And I totally agree that fundamentally, uh, the issue has to is gets driven by land use, but they don't want to talk about land use because land use begins to step on people's property rights. And don't tell me about this. So I would urge you that in in doing in advancing these case studies and moving to these case studies to you know implementation if you will is to what i did in working with 18 municipalities in new hampshire to put together a state's uh, first regional plan in that area dealing with in, with sustainability and so forth was to talk to them in terms of the money i'm a fan of the lincoln institute because they bring that financial perspective to urban planning. Uh, fortunately, and there's an interesting California connection in this room, which a person from Chile here from University of California, Davis, as I was University, University of Southern California, but uh, there was a class in, in land economics, all where we learned how many bushels you could produce from a <laughs> you know, field of, of corn, if you will, or uh, you know, from how many acres of, of land and so forth. But, but uh, you know, the evolution for me coming out of landscape architecture was a building, you know, in the landscape and the building. And then later on, you know, business background, you get wind. It's a building. It was a window with a cash flow. And so it is money that is driving these things and, and profit. And I guess I urge you to, you know, work with somehow engage those urban planners in these communities and try and then also link with the lawyers to try and put together model ordinances that the countries can use, the local ordinances can use, that are going to result in not just case studies and kind of generalized policy recommendations, but real change. That's what we need. We need research, we need case studies that result in legislation and things that can be adopted and, and, and achieved, because they're there but the other, you know, the countries may not know about them or whatever. There are models here in the United States that communities have, other communities do not. That that I that I urge you to move the case study work that you're doing and addressing this topic to implementation. I'm wondering if there's to add a fourth dimension to the prior question. Is there any linkage in your mind between where countries, how these graphs look, and what their their planning regimes look like? And then the second question, which I think really relates to the next slide, is we're thinking here about prices, but did you think at all about affordability? So again, you, you pointed out that uh, prices went up uh, more in US regions that tended to have tighter land use controls. I think San Francisco, where they went up a whole lot, and the problem in San Francisco is not house prices, it's affordability. So how should we think about those price slides, both in relationships to planning regimes, and did you think about, and, and if you did, how would that relate to a question of affordability? 
So can I, can I just answer the Sweden part? Because I was just there, it happens. I was just there on, on mission last week, and and the Swedish, I mean, planning system may 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 look good on paper, but in the reality, it's a total mess. Basically, I mean, it takes like four, <laughs> hey, no, no, really. I mean, people were complaining. It takes like like ten years to basically get something built. I mean, it was like I mean, it, it seems like in in the reality on the ground, it's to totally dysfunctional. And I mean, I mean, that really is the reason why you know you have you have certain booming cities in Sweden, and they're just not stuff is being not enough stuff is being built and that's why you're getting these outcomes that housing prices go like the go go through the sky basically <laughs> yeah so 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 maybe talking about the, the more general point um so i think we would use this slide I, I mean we would not argue that this is a this is a positive development as as you said so so we would see this as a very problematic development because it has it has important distributional consequences which typically go in an, in an unintended direction because uh, existing homeowners who have benefited from this, this rise in property prices are typically uh, the, among the, the, the wealthier part of the population. So the people who have, who have, uh, who have suffered from, from, from the, the rise in housing costs are typically, typically renters and, and first-time buyers and they, they are among the, the, the poorer poorer parts of the, the residents. So, so we see this, I mean, politically, maybe this, this it sometimes it, uh, rising house prices are, are sold as, as a success, but, but we see it much more as, as a problematic development. So, so uh, this is, it's, it's really, it's, we, we see this, this as an issue and we see this as, as, a, as, a, as a policy field which deserves a lot more attention and which is, we think, at, at the moment, which is, is receiving a lot more attention and uh, attention in, in the sense that it's, it's perceived as a, as a problematic development. Um, and secondly, I think we think that, that land, use, land use planning and land use regulations play an important role in, in explaining this picture, but they are far from the, the only uh, policy and regulatory instrument that plays in important role. Uh, as I said, I mean, the, the, the interest rate policies are probably a factor, and then there, there are lot, lots of, of country-specific uh, developments that, that, uh, that are important. So I don't think it's possible to really to, to have a, like a deterministic one-by-one one -one relationship and say, okay, Norway had this kind of house price development, so the planning system must have done this and that uh, the wrong over the, the past uh, f few few decades. I mean, for example, when we look at Norway, Norway is also a country that has seen dramatic increases in, in, uh, in, in income and, and wealth due, due to their, their, their natural resources, and their, their oil. So there, there are always country-specific uh, elements that are, that are going on, and I think it's, yeah, that, that would require a lot more work to really, in, in each particular individual case, to figure out what is responsible for this particular house price development. I had one question related to the slide. So, the, um, so one puzzle, and maybe you can possibly answer, is I've always had is, how did Germany void the, the house price boom and bust um, while the rest of much of the rest of the OCD was experiencing that, okay. I think I, I, I can I can maybe answer a We're bit of time, this. So, oh yeah, sorry. So so very very briefly, um, <laughs> Germany had had fairly low population growth compared to most other uh, OECD countries, and secondly, Germany had a housing bubble right before this chart starts. So. <laughs> 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 and thirdly, there are some places in Germany, like Munich and Hamburg, which have a, had, had huge, huge house price increases. It's just you don't see it because, I mean, there's large parts where basically prices went down. If I can just add one small thing, and I'll be really short. It's kind of like, I mean, why, why are we concerned about these increases in housing prices? Because, I mean, you, you saw earlier the chart that basically more than 80% of the wealth of this in this world is basically in land and housing prices. So basically, when you're seeing this huge changes in, in prices, I mean, you were talking about massive redistribution of wealth. And we're not talking just redistribution of wealth between kind of like, I mean, richer and poorer people, but we're also talking also. redistribution of wealth among, along another two divides at least, maybe there's more. The first one is a generational one because I mean, typically you own more housing stock when you're older than if you're younger. So basically this is a massive redistribution from the younger generations to the older generations, which has 
I mean, a lot of, I mean, probably negative implications for productivity and also for, for, for I mean, social equity and things going forward. And the other one that's maybe less talked about, that's a massive redistribution because typically, you know, the housing prices increase in the big cities, but in the in the countryside, they, they stagnate or even they go down. So basically, there's a massive redistribution basically from the rural areas to the people who are living in the urban areas. And that also is something which has been of a certain concern, especially politically speaking in recent I mean, elections, for example. So I mean, that's also why we, I mean, that's also reasons why we really need to be very careful I mean, about, about these I mean, house price increases because they're having a lot of unintended side sequences on the, on the distributional side. So if, if I just may add something, 30 <laughs> seconds only to this issue. Some, some of you might, might be familiar with, with uh, the recent work by Thomas Piketty who, who has uh, found that there are huge uh, increases in, in wealth inequality across the world and there's actually very, very credible research out there that argues that the entire increase in wealth inequality is due to high, uh, rising uh, uh, property and, la and land prices. So, so this is really uh, this is something that, that should, should motivate why, why uh, land is such an important issue. All right, so we stand between you and a reception, which is what we reward you for sitting in, in such attentive uh, ways. Uh, but I just want to let Lourdes kind of wrap it up and uh, join me in thanking our panelists and discussants. So, Great. Well, I just want to do a few acknowledgments. First of all, thank you to all of you for spending your afternoon with us. Hopefully, you'll join us at the reception for some food and drink overlooking the garden. I want to acknowledge three members of our team, Jenna, D'Angelo, Sherlyn, and Trisha, who are here. They're the reason this whole event came together from speaker preparation, working with our team in Paris, and making sure that everybody got here today and had a wonderful experience. Um, so please join me in thanking them. And also... Um, I encourage you to think about, as we do, where do we go from here? I mean, now that we've heard this great conversation, we've been exposed to this wonderful report, um, one thing that we can offer um, from Lincoln is everybody in this room will receive a link after the event to a pre-recorded webinar. So you'll be able to see the presentation, think about how you can integrate that in your professional settings, whether it's with students, whether it's with you know, urban planners in your community, whether other professionals who are working with and advising cities. We encourage you also to download an electronic copy of the report and to be in touch with us in the OECD team should you want additional information and request hard copies which Lincoln is happy to also ship to you. In addition to that, I know there's been a lot of talk about the importance of concrete and tangible examples and cases. We invite you to tell us what you think those cases should be over the reception or perhaps separately over email as you help Lincoln develop our new case library, focusing on really providing experiential tools that both leaders in the field working with cities and scholars in academia can look to for great examples of what's working and principles we want to advance. So with that, thank you, and please join me with a warm thank you for our speakers today and our wonderful partner at the Boston Fed. Thank you.